Well, thank you for the opportunity uh, to comment on these papers. Uh, it's basically, as you may have seen, it's two practical paper and one theoretical empirical one. Uh, I'll first on the two. I'll first say something on the two practical ones, and then uh, last on the on the more academic paper, so to speak. Uh, the last one first, Michael's paper on uh, Myanmar. Um, in in my reading, uh, it lacks two essential things. I would like to to see in a future version of the paper. Uh, first, a sense of relevance, priorities. Uh, uh, it's a it's a rather comprehensive overview. You 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 are denying that. You say uh, it's not meant to be comprehensive, but it's it, it's really that what transpires. It contains electoral history, uh, an overview over uh, the, the administrative and, and legal framework of elections, even a brief history of, of international monitoring. Uh, I would really like to know, at the current state of elections in Myanmar, uh, what is lacking to, to, sh to, to cross the, sh the threshold towards democracy? Uh, which are the crucial points? Uh, which are the things uh, where we really have still authoritarian powers, democratic deficits, etc. Uh, so really, what does the government need to do? What do we need to demand from the Myanmar government? Uh, and then the second thing I'm missing is a sense of politics. Um, it's, a, it's a diagnostic paper, it's, it's, it's meant, but, it, but it's, it's, it's also meant to have a practical purpose. You, your very title talks about enhancing electoral integrity. And I think we can't do that without thinking about power struggles, political dynamics, which you allude a bit to as here in your last slide and in your concluding um, sentences. But it's, it, it, it's very diffuse. Uh, and if you compare, for example, your paper with uh, the classic analyses of uh, transition dynamics, uh, and I think we, we are seeing a kind of probably a risk if we adopt the language of electoral integrity, electoral administration, election assessment, uh, we, we, we run the risk of turning into technocrats, uh, forgetting about the power struggles that determine ultimate outcomes. So I would like to know too, what does it need politically to shift, to, 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 uh, uh, to succeed, to make Myanmar succeed in its struggle towards democracy? Um, Avery's and David's paper on international standards and the efforts by the Carter Center to translate them uh, into a framework of systematic and objective analysis. Uh, I would like to comment briefly on its three parts, the conceptualization of ele electoral integrity, uh, the operational indicators, and the final judgment, the godlike final judgment. Um, conceptualis conceptualization, uh, in my reading, your way of uh, conceptualizing integrity comes very close to what you paper uh, at the beginning suggested that we should take our concept from international law, from, from uh, uh, well international standards. Uh, and I would reach the same conclusion as yesterday, uh, that we do need a prior conception of electoral integrity. Uh, that your way of kind of inductively seeing what's out there um, is, is kind of uh, it's it, it intuitively plausible, but it really it's it's feeded by a background background concept of democracy and democratic elections. I think you should make explicit. Uh, if you don't, uh, you run into problems such as if you, you lose a basis for criticizing international law. Uh, you just need to accept what is out there, and if it has holes, if it's vague, if it's if it's not binding, if it's whatever, you can't criticize it. Uh, because you depend in your own conception on international law. Uh, also, in your conception of the electoral cycle, I would like to, to, uh, to invite you to be more explicit. Uh, it's kind of commonsensical, and we have those, it's the elements, the, the stages of the cycle, and kind of everybody does it, and you say it, it corresponds roughly to what um, international idea does, and what, uh, what IFES does, what others do, but I still wonder, Hey, why, why are certain things in it? For example, voter education. Your paper is based on voter education, but I think, hey, do we really need, is voter education essential to a democratic election? Probably not. Probably voters have a certain base level of rationality we can trust on uh, and information. Uh, and then there are things like uh, 
yeah, there are your transversal things like the administrative fra framework uh, that, that seems to belong to all other parts. And then all parts contain different things, processes and mechanisms. And so it's, it's conceptually, it, it's again, it's kind of plausible, but not systematically developed. Uh, and, uh, and when you, at the next step, when you operationalize everything and cross tabulate <laughs> everything and create your kind of bit matrix reloaded, um, it's really, I mean, you, you're saying it yourself, it's, it's, it's really a big table, uh, and you're, you're, you're grappling with it. And I think it's over complex. I think, you're in, I think you, what you're visualizing are the pitfalls of trying to be super comprehensive and covering everything. Uh, and I think you're doing many, many things that to me seem redundant, unnecessary, overly complicated. For example, if you, if you cross tabulate every part or every step of the electoral process with your, I think it's 21 internationally accepted electoral standards or criteria, then you, you do some things that I don't find necessary. For example, if you, if, if you try to evaluate uh, the stage of vote counting, uh, I need the standards of arith arithmetic and not the standards of international law regarding whatever. Uh, it's very simple. You don't need to complicate your life, I think. Uh, um, and also, I think it, it, it opens up uh, your problems in the final assessment, uh, in the final judgment. Uh, you're alluding to your, to your um, difficulties in reaching uh, the final uh, judgment. You say, talking of free and fair elections is a soundbite, but it's still the soundbite we often uh, demand from your assessments. Uh, you, 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 we really want to have a, a notion. Is it below or beyond a reasonable threshold of democratic quality? Uh, and if you have those broad spread shields, sheets without uh, criteria of, of priority, it's very difficult to reach that judgment in the end. Um, so in the end, um, the question really arises, uh, what's the purpose of all this? Uh, what's the role of international election monitoring? And I, I tend to think, uh, probably, just consider this, I know it's polemical, but probably you're running into kind of a dead end trying to cover everything. Uh, you're, you're turning into something like uh, management consultants or organizational consultants that come into a firm in this kind, in, in this sense, into, into an election, assess everything, and then make some recommendations of improvements, and here are your strengths, and here are your weaknesses, and then we go home. Um, Probably we should envision a world where you have, uh, let's be bold, an international election court, and you serve as its uh, ministerial investigative police who, 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 who just brings the facts, but, but with a clearer sense of, of uh, on, the ones, on the one hand, of priorities, relevance, and then uh, practical consequences of your conclusions. Uh, um, so far, uh, <coughs> all my time. Okay, Ursula's and 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 Carol's paper. Um, as you've heard, this is about strategies uh, incumbents have to subvert the international norm of election monitoring. Uh, they invite a mix of good and bad, critical and lenient observers uh, to produce uh, contradictory assessments and then get away with it, basically. Uh, this is, well, it's another ambitious paper. I think all three papers are very ambitious, and probably it's also a bit uh, over ambitious, as it uh, analyzes the invitation of mixes of observers as both the, the, uh, um, the dependent and as an independent variable. Uh, and probably you should just do one of the two things. Uh, regarding regarding uh, explanations of when do governments invite certain mixes of observers. Uh, you say, if you're not a democracy, if you have a history of fraud, and if you're dependent on the external environment, you're more likely to invite a mix of observers. Uh, to me, that sounds like, uh, you may think that's an, of, 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 a, of an egocentric observation, given my preoccupation with electoral autocracies. But this sounds to me, if you are an electoral autocracy, you are likely to invite a mix of observers. Uh, if you're a democracy, probably not. Then you wouldn't have a history of electoral fraud, etc. Uh, 
uh, or probably if you are an externally dependent electoral autocracy. I think you are very vague in terms of whom are you talking about. Uh, you either talk without qualifications about regimes, states, governments, incumbents, or you qualify in, the, in a way that sounds vague to me. You talk about semi-democracies, anocracies, uh, unconsolidated regimes. So I think if you specify your, let's say, the scope of your argument, the universe of cases where it's valid, you will reach a better, a theoretically more precise uh, answer. So your, 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 your basic, the results that confirm your initial intuitions seem to me relatively um, too simple, too, too, too predictable from, 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 from the outset. Too. So I would say precise your scope conditions. And regarding the effects of international election observations, <coughs> uh, basically you're saying if, if you invite a mix of observers, you avoid a, a couple of consequences that are unpleasant to you as a dictator, incumbent government. Uh, I'll say, okay, that's possible. Uh, but then you have a very different kinds of consequences. Um, government turnover, regular, irregular, and irregular is either coup or uh, the closure of the electoral arena or something <coughs> like an electoral revolution. I would say these are very different outcomes. Probably you need three different theories to explain them. Uh, then you have protest and repression against very different outcomes. There's rather big literature out there on repression, on, uh, on political protest. And you are kind of trusting your Y-centered design. Uh, we are interested in the effects of the why, the invitation of observers on different axes, but in the end you can't escape, is, is, escape the necessity to think about the alternative explanations for your axis. Uh, and I think you really, you, 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 you try to, 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 to evade the, the, the demand for more theory, and I think you, you really need it. Uh, and you have, even in your empirics, you have many, many things you, you don't have a theory for. You distinguish uh, between inviting one or two uh, high quality observers, but really there are no, no hypotheses that, that justify that distinction. And you end up saying probably we should choose it. Uh, you, you don't have theories on your reference categories of not inviting anybody, uh, which is probably equivalent to inviting just bad observers. Um, and you have, you have one, you have a mix of positive and negative findings, and I think you interpret them creatively. Uh, but you have one consistently cons strong finding that is if you invite critical observers uh, in the presence of fraud, uh, or the other way around, if you see fraud or experience fraud and have critical observers present, then you have strong effects. Uh, then you augment the probability of irregular turnovers, of protest, and of repressions. Then really something happens. Uh, and you, since this is not... Uh, the core of your expectations, you don't kind of, you, you, you leave it on the side. Uh, and I think that's a strong finding, and you should think more about it, what it means, what, it, uh, uh, what you could make out of it. Um, I'll leave it here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. It's time to throw it open to questions. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Gabrielle Bardell at the University of Montreal. Uh, my questions are addressed to the, the Carter Center team and also to Ursula. Uh, so first, David and Avery, thank you both so much for your presentation. I think you are treading um, a very difficult position between uh, realizing the, the application of the, of the theories that we're talking about here today. And despite the methodological challenges that you're continuing to face with it, um, I think it's an important step. I think it reflects a change in international observation of elections towards a response to these issues of electoral integrity and other issues as well. Uh, there was one part of your presentation that was implicit but didn't come out clearly. Not only is your data collection improving, but also your analysis of that data is improving, which is an important change. Uh, in observation, you're, you're using more long-term experts, um, thematic experts in groups like this, which is, a, which is an important shift. Um, but you're still faced with this challenge, um, which is fundamental to election observation, and my question is related to that. Uh, there's two approaches to observation. One, uh, 
sending observers out to where they're most needed to prevent violence and other types of fraud and to help increase the sense of security for voters to participate on one hand. And then on the other hand, as we talked about yesterday, using a randomized scientific technique in order to, um, to, to make a more scientific judgment of an election. So I was wondering how you position yourselves according to that and where you feel the limit is on, um, on, on putting numbers on, on these electoral issues. The other question uh, for Ursula, uh, I think you have a, a very natural connection with um, the work that Emily Bolio has been doing with, uh, with boycotts, and I would be curious to see as a future research path, um, you know, how the presence of poor quality observers uh, affects opposition behavior. Does it affect uh, boycotts and, and other behavior like that? And a simple question as far as methodology goes, um, are low quality observers consistently low quality in your study uh, or only sometimes? Um, can an organization be very credible in most situations but 2% uh, of the time be not credible in a specific context? Thanks. And uh, Pippa and then James. I really enjoyed all the papers, and I thought they really contributed tremendously. Um, but I've got a question for all three in a way, which is really about the normative standards. I think in particular, David and Avery have put really tremendous amount of work into de developing the database, and it's a splendid effort to really consolidate. What are the areas, however, which we're still really missing? What are the normative priorities where the international community hasn't hammered out any agreement? And what are the areas which would strengthen then the standards of those which you term low quality, and also the role of domestic observers, because there actually would be a normative international agreement. And clearly, uh, the UN came together in 2005 for the standards and protocols on electoral observing, but really that uh, what we need to get is the standards and protocols on elections per se, and what would be your priorities, and how do we get there? What's the steps we need to do politically, because it is a political process, to get some standards in place um, and that's also a question, of course, for the international organizations uh, in, the, in the room as a whole. Thank you. Uh, James Long, Harvard University. Um, David and Avery, I think what you're doing is really, really fantastic. And I think all of us who've done international election observation have always wanted a consistent tool to use and to think about how we comment on the process. So I really want to congratulate you for that. And I think it's a fantastic research agenda. Um, you end your paper and your presentation with these really kind of fundamental questions, um, such as, for example, how much weight or value to give to the various parts of the electoral process and the relative obligations when trying to arrive at an overall assessment of the process as a whole. I think that's a great question to ask, but I guess, you know, the Carter Center has been rendering overall judgments for a long time, and the fact that they sort of institutionally haven't answered that question, there seems to be sort of a disconnect then between what you're doing in your research agenda and what the Carter Center has been doing and what, in fact, other international organizations are doing. I mean, if every organization adopted your tools, we would sort of get around Ursula's problems of having high and low quality election observation because they would both be there. So I'm wondering if you can just comment on sort of, are you guys up against a wall or what culturally needs to change or why it is that there's sort of this disconnect between uh, international organizations like the Carter Center continuing to render overall assessments without sort of yet having fully adopted your tools and methodologies? Why don't we throw it back to the panel, give a chance to respond, get a couple more questions. We have time. Um, let me try a couple of quick responses, and um, Avery should definitely help on a few of these. Um, so let's see, on the question, I remember, I guess Gabrielle answered about deterring fraud versus um, providing an overall assessment. Uh, we're, as I hope is implicit in what we presented, we see our job as doing a thorough assessment, documenting it thoroughly, and providing an, uh, an objective approach to what we're doing. We hope that that can detour fraud, and I think some of the other research shows and other practice shows that your very presence can have an impact in deterring fraud. But we deliberately try not to have our observers go only to places where we think there's going to be problems. So we're trying to get you know, a, a representative picture. But we are, as international observers, we are hamstrung by the, the smaller number. But we are constantly trying to think of ways that we can increase the degree to which what we're seeing is representative. And there's ways to try to do that. We also do a lot of cross-checking with other observer groups, uh, both international and domestic. So routinely. We are always you know, gathering data, comparing data, talking to people, cross-checking, 
know, that kind of thing. So that's the best we can do at this point, but we're not doing the how can we deter fraud. That's not, not the guiding question. So I hope that answers you. Um, Pippa, on the, the normative priorities and what's missing, I'm going to ask Avery to, to jump in and to supplement this. But uh, and, and in part, this goes to some of what Andreas has talked about. Uh, clearly, where the biggest gaps are are uh, campaign finance and media and, and other places. But uh, the question of where a, your theory of democratic elections overlaps with the theory of democracy more broadly gets, not your question, the question becomes relevant to this discussion because democracy and a theory of democracy is a bigger question than a theory of a democratic election. And I think what we have in our research, and it's really it's a database more so than a research, it's a method, is an implicit theory of a democratic election, but it knows that there's pieces in international law that are not full yet. And they, they do, again, principally relate to campaign finance uh, and media access, but others too. Uh, would you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the only other things that I would add specifically to gaps are maybe um, a fuller sort of understanding of access to information and transparency and corruption in the context of elections um, and sort of these issues um, around access to information that are very time bound in the context of an election and access to documents, not just, and to, to meetings and, and sort of the pressures that the time bound nature of the election puts on this sort of very general obligation to access to information and, and freedom of speech. And then I guess the other gap would be a regional gap in that um, and Michael sort of touched on, on it in the case of, of Burma and the ICCPR not being ratified there, that Asia continues to be a sort of a regional gap, basically. There isn't a lot um, that is established as, as regional obligations in the context of Asia, although it's starting to emerge as time mm. passes. And one last quick comment, Pip, I think to your larger question too about how to get to international standards. I think what we've seen from the practitioner community is that it's, it's largely there except for these missing pieces. But as a community, there's a lot of coalescence around this kind of approach. And m most of the observer organizations in the high quality category are taking very, very compatible, similar approaches. Our methodologies are slightly different, but it's almost the same in what we're doing. And so we're, we're actually applying a pretty consistent yardstick, I think, that is that has this basis in public international law to our assessment, which really is about <coughs> standards. So I don't know, is that asking, answering your question or not really? So we don't need to have a more explicit agreement. I don't, I mean, I guess maybe at some point uh, we could, but it's, it's not clear to me what's going to be the best way to, whether or not it's needed, and if so, how to, how to get there. I think there's, there's a, a lot of, uh, of uh, kind of coalescing around this in agreement. And I invite my other uh, practitioner <coughs> colleagues in the room who you know, may want to comment on that. But let me just quickly get to um, James's question about this apparent disconnect between obligations and overall assessment. I think that was part, partially Andreas's comment, too. Um, yes, of course, we've been doing overall assessments all, all the time in our election missions. And while we're saying that these are difficult questions, we're not trying to say that we don't, in the end, have the responsibility to come to an overall assessment. We do routinely. What we're talking about, though, is are the obligations uh, can you? It really comes down to a question of can you weigh them and scale them in a way that's meaningful comparatively cross-nationally. And our hunch is that's going to be really, really difficult to do that because essentially what we're doing is we're making subjective decisions based on a lot of objective data gathered as systematically as possible trying to render a meaningful conclusion about what we've seen. And we see obligations in some countries that just mean something different in other places. And to, to try to think, you know, the example that I've pointed to in some places is the secret ballot. You know, in Spain, we know that there's been failures to protect the secret ballot. People will sometimes you know, reveal their vote. We saw that in Sudan in the, uh, the referendum in 2011. Many gaps in secret ballot. But in another context, the failure to ensure a secret ballot can be hugely important. That's just one little example. But it, the point is, is that the obligations have to be understood in a, in a context. Not that you're having a different standard, but you're applying it in a different context. And that's the part that makes it these questions so difficult. Difficult mostly in the sense of can we scale them, weigh them, and number them. It's not really difficult. I mean, it's difficult, but it's not. We do it every time we have a mission. We render a judgment. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> 
Ursula? Okay, well, um, thanks for the discussion and also the questions. Um, those are tremendous comments, and I can't start to uh, address all of them right now without taking up half an hour. Um, <clears throat> about your comment on whether it's simply the more authoritarian regimes inviting the mixed observation missions, I think definitely that is something that we need to think about uh, more carefully. I would hope that because the supply of these low quality monitors is much more regionally concentrated, that maybe we can uh, get at that, not, not, not necessarily get at it, but get out of, you know, essentially, you know, having a sample where, where it's simply those most authoritarian countries inviting those uh, mixed observation missions. But, um, um, so, you know, because to, to some income is simply not available. And, uh, you know, probably there's also quite a bit of variation uh, in the African context and in the post-Soviet context. Uh, but, but I would agree that, that that is something that we need to think about uh, more carefully. Now, about your point that our results uh, aren't necessarily counterintuitive, that, you know, it's somewhat to be expected that when you invite these low quality monitors, you know, that that can help undermine uh, some of the benefits of election monitoring. I, I would agree with you that it's not necessarily counterintuitive, but it strikes me as quite uh, relevant from a policy perspective still to know that when these actors are present, uh, you know, perhaps one should be more careful in how to share and disseminate results and perhaps by finding more creative ways of disseminating and sharing the findings of the more high quality monitors, one could try and then also strategically counteract uh, and balance the uh, claims that uh, uh, incumbents make about, you know, mainly only publicizing the, the comments by low quality monitors and trying to sell that as, well, that's the assessment of the international community. Um, so that would be my response to that. Now about your question on dynamics of the opposition in response to uh, the presence uh, or the invitations of these mixed missions, I, I very much agree with you that that would be very interesting uh, to examine. A bit of a problem with it is that we're already making this argument that is quite conditional, you know, on the basis of you have this presence of a mix of organizations, but you also need to actually have to have an incumbent that engages in cheating. So it would be tricky for us empirically to, to, to get at that, but we should probably at a minimum look at some illustrative cases and see whether those dynamics play out. I mean, there are probably also intera uh, interesting interactions with regard to media freedom, extent of media freedom, right? I mean, if the incumbent controls the media, then it's probably much easier for them to take advantage of friendly reports or reports by friendly organizations. And um, I, I also think it's a very good point to ask about, you know, are these low quality monitors, low quality monitors all the time, the way we've operationalized it, it's, it's, it's simply a set of organizations that either never or almost never criticizes organization sites. So that doesn't change over time, but I think you're, you're very much right that there could be some dynamics in terms of, you know, maybe a form of colonial relationship where uh, organizations that are usually credible might sometimes become uh, less reputable, and, and that is something that we should also explore uh, in more detail. And, um, yeah, so thank you very much for the comments. Yeah, also thank you very much for, for the comments. Uh, first, Andreas, I, mean, I really appreciate your points. Uh, they're, they're well taken, I'll, I'll take them home. Um, uh, just to say, they're like half of the paper that I was uh, giving today and I was presenting here, uh, uh, the part about the emergence of, um, of election observers in the authoritarian, authoritarian context of Myanmar, I, I've published that elsewhere uh, until that point and I tried to, uh, and, and that paper has more of political context and regime classification and so forth, though although of course it can be much stronger. And what I tried today is to, to, to go half a step or a step further and go more towards uh, fields of exchange between international actors and local counterparts, which is something I'm really interested in and I'm still kind of uh, grappling with getting a real, a real grip on that. Um, but. I'd, I'd be very happy to continue uh, the conversation. Um, on uh, Pippa's uh, uh, large question, of course, that is also a, a very large question to, uh, to, to take away, I think, for, <laughs> for all of us from here. What I really wanted to do with this paper is to show uh, how, even in the most presumably unlikely uh, scenarios, how demands for, for electoral integrity uh, can grow from below, even if they're not expressed per se as that. Um, but when I then looked at it, tried to look at it through a lens of international standards, I, I could see that uh, the, the larger standards for civic freedom, such as the freedom of 
assembly, expression and movement were the ones that really were really important and really changed the, the conditions for participation in uh, the electoral framework. And, and, and by engaging there, uh, something changed about uh, the election as well. Um, building up on some points that David uh, uh, just mentioned here, uh, and, and Avery, uh, I can perfectly agree, and we can see that on, on the level of panels today, there are legs in, in Asia, there are legs in, in Southeast Asia, what concerns uh, regional standards. When we look at Southeast Asia, there are very, very different practices across, uh, across the 10 countries. Um, and uh, although there are developments, I would also say there are very interesting developments uh, at uh, at the moment that could be uh, could could open windows of opportunity Myanmar is holding the ASEAN chairmanship uh, next year um, in, in in some respect for example for media freedoms uh, Myanmar uh, unexpectedly has become something like a star in the region and uh, the chairmanship next year with elections in the year after might provide an opportunity to to, to create spaces to discuss regional standards, both for elections and election observation. Uh, what I am sometimes missing, and I'll conclude on that point, when, when I try to apply uh, uh, universal standards uh, is proper tools to really do that in, in, in context-sensitive ways. Um, for example, again on, on, on the Myanmar case, uh, in Myanmar case, if we look through uh, the universal standards lens, we would diagnose a clear violation of uh, universal suffrage because monks are not allowed to vote. This is a practice that is not uncommon in the region. Uh, same we would know from Thailand, uh, culturally very much accepted. But how do we really tackle that uh, in, in the analysis of, of the electoral framework, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite comfortable uh, with a the solution there. Let's open it up to another couple questions. A couple hands over here. I have a question for David. Uh, you said that um, there might be not be a need to further um, reach international agreement on the operationalization of the standards. Um, I slightly disagree. I just worked on an opinion for the Venice Commission on the um, the democratic uh, the question if Monaco should be considered a democ democracy or not, and uh, all the experts agreed on the applicable international text and applications. But we all reached a very different conclusion on uh, the actual factual question. And the same is in the Netherlands. We've been uh, criticized by ODIR for not having uh, in our election law the possibility of challenging uh, election results in the court. And instead of uh, having a debate in parliament on the question whether that would be good or not, the parliamentarians are want, want to know from the ministry uh, where does it say in international law that we have to have uh, that in our international law. So how do you prevent your operationalization of the obligations becoming the, the debate instead of the actual recommendations that you make. Well, uh, thank you, Aminu Gamawa, um, Harvard Law School. I have a question for David and then Ursala. And uh, to be very quick, David, um, you talk about um, uh, grounding the indicators on public international law. And I know the sources of public international law are hierarchical and uh, uh, your indicators are not, you have not hierarchized the indicators. Um, so the, the, the major challenge that I see here is uh, the tendency for some of the indicators to be more acceptable in some states and uh, not in others. Uh, not all states actually accorded the same uh, treatment to uh, international law, and uh, you see that in their national uh, uh, and, and domestic um, law, their approach towards international law. So uh, don't you think that um, using public international law in a way is, is really being um, uh, in a way unnecessarily controversial? Because I, I know there are some states that uh, find um, um, uh, the provisions of public international law quite problematic. And um, to Ursara, my, my, my point is related to um, legitimizing um, uh, uh, an invalid election or uh, the incumbent. Uh, one key challenge uh, which I think happened in Nigeria in the last 2011 election was uh, the fact that the 2011 election was held as better than the 2007 election, that 
uh, acknowledgement of improvement was used as a government as, as as a form of endorsement so how do we communicate um, um, that there is an improvement without appearing necessarily to have endorsed uh, the process because i think this is uh, quite uh, a major challenge and uh, uh, the tendency is uh, in places where they think the election is not fair uh, it delegitimizes the election observers generally and uh, they, they think that you have uh, sided with the government and uh, the governments are very good in using uh, pronouncements made by uh, bodies like the, the, the Qatar Center, which has been working in Nigeria for quite a long time. So that's my, my comment. Thank you. Uh, uh, just to briefly resp uh, respond to the question that Pippa raised regarding international electoral standards and election observation. Uh, well, first, I think I would agree with my colleague David uh, in the sense that we are, as practitioners that are part of a community that's uh, that's work thinking and working through these issues, more and more we're coalescing in terms of what we consider to be the integrity of elections or a democratic election. I can tell you a little bit, uh, and I will try to be brief, uh, in the case of the OAS, what we did in 2006 is to take a look at key juridical, uh, inter-American juridical instruments uh, that the member states had approved in the 40s and 60s, and you know the Declaration of uh, uh, the of Human Right, Inter-American Declaration of Human Rights, the Convention on the Rights of Men, and of course, the Inter-American Democratic Charter. And what we did is we disaggregated uh, on, from those instruments a series of indicators, and, and of course, it's a rights-based uh, uh, approach, and uh, created a definition or, or the concept of democratic elections that contemplates uh, four components: inclusiveness, competitiveness, cleanness and uh, that I guess uh, that they have that the elections happen periodically and that the results are irreversible and uh, and of course you, you may hear from what I'm saying uh, some of the that some of what's being discussed in the literature because Jerry Monk was part of the team that that helped us put together this uh, definition and what we did is we based on these uh, big components we created indicators uh, issues at stake and in the in the end what we did is translate some of these issues in question in, into the questionnaires that the observers use on election day but what we realized, realized and, and this is something that was discussed earlier in the, in the Latin American panel, that uh, the challenges that we were facing uh, as election observers uh, were not necessarily linked to election day. Uh, a lot of the things that the, 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 the problems and irregularities that used to happen were not happening as much, but the, the challenges were be, uh, linked to the pre-electoral uh, phase. And if you think about the four components, more on the uh, competitiveness aspects of the election. Um, so what we did um, is to create uh, 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 this, this methodology that in the end is also gave, ri gave rise to other methodologies that are working on issues of political financing, for instance, access to media uh, and gender. Uh, the, the idea was, well, first, these uh, instruments, inter-American instruments were part of a larger discussion that was happening at the international level. So everything that's content, the rights that are contemplated in these instru instruments are also part of the, a lot of the uh, um, documents and materials that the database that the Carter Center has put together contemplate. So we, it's not like we're you know, thinking weird things that, that, that uh, don't correspond to the international standards. But more than that, what uh, helped in terms of the impact of the election observation by the OAS was to bl to safeguard us, I guess is the word in Spanish is blindar. Um, it it uh, safeguarded our statements and the statements that the missions gave in the sense that the countries could not really question what we were saying uh, because we were using a framework that was u that was uh, taking into consideration rights and, 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 and obligations that they had made as part of the inter-American community. So uh, it's in our view since 2006 uh, has actually improved the way that we do election observation and has also improved the way uh, the, the content and the contributions and the value added that OAS election observation can have uh, for the countries. Uh, just to share that very briefly, and I'm sorry it's not that articulate, but I just, I just thought of sharing it uh, right now. The question, the comment that I had for Ursula, I think it's a very interesting paper. Uh, I, I like that um, that someone is considering low quality and, 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 and high quality observation. And, and I tell you, uh, you mentioned that you, according to your analysis, you're only seeing that in Africa and Eastern Europe. But I also want to br bring to the discussion and for you 
for you and your, your colleague to consider the case of Latin America in the sense that since 2011, the Union of South American Countries, UNASUR, um, uh, you know, came into being and, and since a couple of years ago has created an, elect an electoral council that's also deploying election observation missions. And of course, it's only circumscribed uh, to 12 countries in South America. It doesn't include the rest of the countries that we do observation in. But I, I would invite you to take a look at that phenomenon. And, and from a practitioner's point of view, this is, is a challenge that we're also face facing, additional to many other things that were <laughs> challenges and, and, and that we're facing as OIS in the sense that we were recently, for instance, in, in Paraguay and we were in, in February for the presidential, selection, presidential elections in Ecuador and both OAS and UNASUR deployed missions. And there's this, always this tension and this, uh, um, uh, what do you say, uh, competition, I guess, uh, between UNASUR and, and OAS in terms of the statements and this perception that uh, these uh, uh, presidents invite UNASUR missions because they also want fa favorable uh, statements from, from the institutions. I, and, I mean, it would be interesting to, for you to do an analysis in terms of Latin, also in the Latin American region and thinking of this uh, UNASUR vis-a-vis -vis OIS. Thank you. One last quick question before lunch. Uh, Andy, you had your hand up. Um, just a very brief comment for Michael because I think it speaks to issues for the conference more generally, uh, which is when you're thinking about Burma, and I know you've done a raft of other work on this, but your paper today, I think there's a question about focus and there's a question about what variable it's best to put our scholarly and practitioner attention towards. Because in the case of Burma, I think it's reasonable to say that short-term election observation is not really the primary problem nor issue. In 1988, in 2010, and in 2012, vote malfeasance stealing on the day or in the short term really surprisingly was not the issue. And I think the broad issues, to my mind, are the constitutional framework, which is obviously a stacked game against democratization. And um, over time, the USDA, the government sort of black shirts in the townships have developed a clientelistic system where they're controlling the behavior of people because they're loaning the money. There's a clientelistic social corruption within the electoral system, which is not legal, but it's the construction of the Burmese state over the last five, ten years. So, so my question is, and I think for all of us, is that with limited time, with limited resources, um, with uh, trying to get the biggest bang for your buck, both in research and practitioner attention, I don't think issues like election observation in the short term are an issue. Longer term observation is obviously important, looking at the broader frameworks. But I think this is a case that illustrates that really our attention should be on the broader construction issues of a state and how it's working. Because surprisingly in Burma, vote stealing on the day, uh, miscounting, surprisingly hasn't really been an issue. So that's just a comment. Okay, great. I would like to thank the uh, panelists and uh, our discussant and the great questions. We now have um, a lunch break until two o'clock. Thank you. Hey.